A mother in the Thar Desert once spent four hours each day walking for water, while salt-laced wells and searing 50 degrees Celsius heat erased every shortcut. But here is what makes this impossible. Today, her family draws water from beneath their own feet, even though the landscape is drier than Death Valley, and just two or three rainstorms must support 25 million people all year. If conventional fixes failed for decades, how did this desert become home to the world's densest oasis? And what is the secret that made the impossible routine? Before we break that down, it's worth pausing for a moment to keep learning from real cases, proven solutions, and examples that challenge what we think is possible, stay connected and follow the channel to see how ingenuity quietly reshaped the future. The Thar Desert stretches across more than 200,000 square kilometers of Northwest India, pressing up against the border with Pakistan. This is not an empty wilderness. Here, 25 million people live, farm and raise families, more than anywhere else on earth for a desert. Yet the land itself seems designed to test human endurance. In peak summer, temperatures soar past 45 degrees Celsius, with heat waves pushing the mercury to 50 degrees Celsius. The air trembles with dry wind and the ground bakes to a hard crust. The challenge here is extreme. Rainfall arrives as a brief, violent visitor. Just two or three storms a year, sometimes as little as 100 millimeters and often none at all for months on end. Relief can be sudden and intense, then gone almost as quickly. The rains are brief and every moment of them matters. Each year, evaporation pulls more water from the land than the rain brings, sometimes by a factor of 5 or 10. Open water left exposed can vanish in days. Potential evapotranspiration here is among the highest in India, reaching up to 2,200 millimeters a year. In this environment, every drop must be captured and hidden away before the sun claims it. Digging deeper offers little hope. Across most of the Thar, groundwater lies far below the surface, and what is there is often too salty for people or crops. Decades of tube well drilling have only deepened the problem, drawing up brackish water that leaves white crusts on the soil and damages fields. Wells that once promised relief now stand abandoned, their water unfit to drink. With rivers hundreds of kilometers away and canals too costly or risky for most villages, survival depends on what falls from the sky and only for a few hours each year. Every community faces the same equation, capture the rain when it comes or face a year of scarcity. Survival here is literal and immediate. For generations, this harsh arithmetic shaped daily life. Women and girls walked four, sometimes 10 kilometers a day for water. Crops failed in drought years. Migration became a last resort for families searching for work and water. In the Thar, nature's terms are non-negotiable. The only way forward is to work with the land, not against it. Ingenious water harvesting is not just an option here, it is the difference between life and empty desert. Every morning begins before sunrise for women in the Thar. The air is still cool, but the weight of the day presses in early. A mother ties her scarf, lifts a battered metal pot, and sets out with her daughter. Their path is worn into the dust, four kilometers each way, sometimes more in dry years. There is no shortcut. The family's survival depends on these daily journeys. This is the daily burden. The walk is not a gentle stroll. By mid-morning, the sun is already fierce, pushing temperatures toward 40 degrees Celsius, the relentless heat. The sand burns underfoot, and the wind brings no relief, only grit. Each trip means hours lost to the road, muscles aching from the load. A single pot of water weighs as much as a small child, and most families need several each day. Women in the Thar often spend three to five hours fetching water, their hands marked by years of carrying, their backs bent from the strain. Joint pain and heat stress are common companions. For girls, the journey is not just physical, it is a barrier to opportunity. Many daughters walk beside their mothers instead of sitting in classrooms. School is a distant hope when water comes first. Teachers in desert villages recall empty benches during the dry season, especially among older girls. The loss is measured not just in lessons missed, but in futures narrowed by necessity. Time spent on the water walk 
is time taken from everything else. Work, study, rest, even play. The burden falls hardest on women and girls, shaping the rhythm of family life and limiting what is possible. In some villages, studies have counted up to one-third of a woman's waking hours devoted to water collection. The cost is invisible but immense, lost income, missed education, and health worn down by the unending routine. Yet even as the desert tests its people, it is the quiet determination of women and their daughters that keeps families together. Each day's walk is an act of endurance and hope. The dream is simple, water close at hand, a future where girls trade the water path for the schoolyard. In the Thar, that dream is beginning to take shape, not through distant rivers or deep wells, but through solutions that start at home. In the heart of the Thar, the answer to water scarcity begins with a surprising sight, broad, open ponds shimmering under the desert sun. At first glance, these seem like a losing gamble. With temperatures topping 50 degrees Celsius and evaporation rates among the highest in India, any exposed water could vanish in days. Yet for villages scattered across this arid plain, these ponds are lifelines, engineered to catch and hold the full force of the monsoon's brief, wild generosity. The secret lies in timing and placement. Each year, rain arrives not as a gentle drizzle, but as a sudden flood, sometimes in just two or three storms. Local water stewards, often working with organizations like Gravis since the early 1980s, walk the land before the season, reading subtle slopes and tracing the flow of water after the first drops fall. Natural depressions are mapped, catchment areas measured, and embankments shaped to funnel every possible drop toward the pond. Some of these community ponds, called nadis, can hold up to 40,000 cubic meters, a year's supply for hundreds of people and their livestock. Smaller ponds serve hamlets, while larger ones anchor entire villages. The soil at the bottom is compacted or lined with clay to slow seepage, and the banks are reinforced to withstand the rush of stormwater. Over time, villagers learn which ponds never run dry, even in lean years. One water steward recalls watching tanker tractors, once forced to make long, dusty journeys, now filling up just outside the village from a pond that had water through the worst drought. The paradox becomes clear, in a land where groundwater is too salty and rivers are out of reach. The fastest way to permanent water is to capture it above ground, all at once, and accept the cost of some evaporation. The alternative, letting it run away, means a year of thirst. These ponds are not just storage, they are the first link in a chain, setting up the next stage of survival where every overflow and every drop is put to work. In the Thar Desert, a single rainstorm can shape the year's harvest. When the monsoon finally arrives, water rushes down barren slopes, threatening to vanish as quickly as it came. Farmers here have learned to catch this fleeting gift sculpting the land into cardines, broad earthen embankments that stand at the edge of every field. Behind each bund, a shallow basin waits, ready to capture the storm's runoff. The cardine is more than a barrier. It is a system, refined by generations who read the land's smallest features. When rain falls, water pools behind the embankment, flooding the field just enough to soak the soil. As it drains, it leaves behind a band of moist earth, an urgent invitation to plant. There is only one chance. Seeds must go in immediately before the ground dries. Miss it, and the field remains bare for another year. In years of plenty, the design reveals its full strength. Fields are laid out in a gentle sequence, each one lower than the last. As the uppermost cardin fills, its spillway channels water to the next basin and then the next, creating a chain of temporary lakes. What starts as a sudden flood becomes a measured cascade, each basin soaking up what it needs before passing the rest along. The result is a patchwork of green crops and shaded berms, where days before there was only sand. Trees are woven into this system. Along every bund, kedri and bear trees grow in rows. 
Their branches shield young shoots from harsh winds, while roots anchor the soil, holding the embankment firm. In dry months, leaves and pods feed livestock. Fruits supplement the family's meals. These living boundaries offer shade and help keep precious topsoil in place. One village leader walks his cut in after every storm, searching for weak spots. He remembers each flood, each drought, each tree that survived. For him, the Kadin is both legacy and duty. Every harvest proves that working with the land's rhythms can turn a single storm into months of food. Here, resilience is not luck, it is a system shaped by necessity and care. Beneath the packed earth of a Thar courtyard, a quiet revolution is taking place. The Teanka, an underground rainwater cistern, brings the promise of water directly to the doorstep. For families once bound to the rhythm of distant ponds and the relentless march for water, the Talanka changes everything. Each one is built to last, lined with ferrisment for strength, and tucked safely under the floor or courtyard. With a capacity of 20,000 liters, a single Talanka can hold enough water from just a few storms to supply a household for five or six months. The engineering is deceptively simple. Rooftop gutters channel every drop of monsoon rain through a zigzag silt trap, where heavier particles settle out before water slips into the cool darkness below. A snug lid keeps sunlight and insects out, sharply reducing evaporation and contamination. Some homes also draw runoff from compacted ground catchments, boosting the inflow during bigger storms. For gravest field engineers like Sunil, Success is measured not in blueprints, but in the lives transformed. He remembers the first time a family opened the hatch to their new tanker and drew clean water without leaving home. The pride in that moment is hard to overstate. In the past, water collection shaped every day, dictating when women rose, where girls walked, and how much time was left for anything else. Now, a mother can fill a pot in minutes and her daughter can sit at a school desk instead of waiting in line at a distant well. The Taanka is not just a modern invention. In some villages, ancient rock-cut cisterns, hand-carved 60 years ago or more, still serve as community reservoirs. These massive tanks, holding up to 300,000 liters, have been retrofitted with new silt traps and reinforced linings, blending old wisdom with new materials. The ripple effects are everywhere. With water close at hand, women have time for income-generating work and children's attendance in local schools rises year after year. Health improves as families rely less on contaminated surface water. The Tanka delivers more than water. It opens the door to opportunity, dignity, and a future shaped by choice rather than scarcity. Rainfall in the Thar is not just rare, it is unpredictable. Some years, a village might see only 90 millimeters, barely enough to dampen the dust. Other years, a cluster of storms can push totals to 300 millimeters or more. The difference between a good year and a bad one is measured in centimeters. But for families, it is the line between security and crisis. Engineers in the desert work with a simple calculation. Roof area multiplied by rainfall, adjusted for how much water actually runs off. Take a standard home with a 50 square meter roof. In a year with 100 millimeters of rain and a runoff efficiency of 80%, that roof can deliver about 4,000 liters to a storage tank. Spread over a household of five people plus a few animals, that covers only a fraction of their needs. At strict survival rates, about 25 liters per person per day, plus water for livestock, a family can stretch 4,000 liters for only 20 days. But the Thar strategy is not to rely on a single roof or a single tank. When several homes connect their roofs, or when a community pools catchment areas, storage multiplies. In a good year, four houses together can collect nearly 16,000 liters from the same 100 millimeters of rain. Still, even this is not enough for six months, unless the rains are generous or tanks are supplemented from ponds or tanker deliveries. Storage grows when communities link systems, but it must be planned. The math is relentless. In drought years, tanks may fill only partway, forcing families back to distant sources or rationing every drop. In wet years, tanks overflow, 
and the surplus can be shared or stored in ponds. Survival here depends on understanding these calculations, on planning for the worst, and building systems that can stretch each rare storm across the long dry months ahead. Math and planning make the difference between short-term coping and lasting resilience. In the early 1980s, as droughts swept Rajasthan and wells turned brackish, a small team in Jodhpur started something that would ripple across the desert. Gravis, Gramin Vikas Vigyan. Samiti took shape in 1983, guided by Gandhian ideals and a belief that villages could control their own fate. The first ponds and tayankas were not grand projects, but careful experiments. Could reviving old wisdom and building new structures actually change the land? Over the next four decades, the answer unfolded in thousands of villages. What began as scattered ponds and embankments grew into a connected network, catchments, cardines, and household cisterns, each one multiplying the effect of the last. Farmers tracked results not just in water jars and harvests, but in the color of the land itself. Where once the monsoon left only a brief flush of green, now fields held their color longer. Trees planted along berms stood taller each year. Cattle grazed where sand once drifted. Remote sensing satellites, orbiting far above, began to pick up subtle changes. Over time, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, a measure of living green, ticked upward in clusters where water harvesting spread. Time-lapse imagery shows patches of brown desert giving way to islands of green, even as temperatures climbed and rainfall stayed stubbornly fickle. These are not accidental oases, but the cumulative result of thousands of small decisions where to dig, what to plant, and how to share. Today, the legacy of Gravis and its partners is not just measured in liters or hectares, but in the very texture of the land. From orbit, the Thar is no longer a uniform expanse of sand. It is a patchwork of resilience, proof that when people work with nature, even a desert can be transformed. Today, 25 million people in the Thar Desert prove that water security is not a privilege. It is a product of innovation. As climate extremes threaten regions worldwide, their solutions offer a roadmap. Work with nature, not against it. The world's most densely populated desert is not an outlier, it is a warning and a blueprint. If resilience can take root here, what is stopping us elsewhere? Share your thoughts below.